Hi, welcome to the Inner Sense of Architecture and Art. I'm Stefan Golan Brown, and today I'm talking about this essay called The Grid, History, Use, and Meaning by Jack H. Williamson. So this essay talks about the grid and the history and the symbolic sense of the grid through history in the Western world. Now, and in particular, he puts emphasis on the shifts and changes of our sense of the grid. And he defines this very much of shifts as in different types of typology of the grid. He has a point, the singular point of the grid, the intersection, the cell, and then the horizontal and vertical in a kind of detached sense. He begins first looking at the late medieval grid. He points out that in um, medieval manuscripts, grids were used to organize text and even the images. The main example that he uses here is from a book of hours from the late 15th century called Les Très Belles Heures de Notre Dame. He points out how there's a vertical connection emphasized also with the um, the valley there in the horizon between the birth of John the Baptist and the baptism of Christ down below. He then also points out a really fascinating thing is that the shape of John the Baptist uh, uh, baptizing Christ is almost identical or at least kind of repeats the form of the boulder to the right and that in the the whole kind of downward shape of the valley on the left is mirrored by the upward shape of the mountain on the right and that this brings us up to the window frame above which is just opposite of the birth of John the Baptist. So his argument here is that the grid was used as a way of representing the superphysical's manifestation in the physical and to tie together meaning, um, the sense of the divine breaking in upon the world and that creating this web, this intersection, this moment of crossing. Of course, here with all the, the, the sense of, of, of Christ's cross in there as well. Now, he then um, points out that there was a, then a shift in the Renaissance, um, especially with the development of Cartesian grids. Of course, a lot of people talk about how the Renaissance really was this shift, this movement into modernity. And here he points out how the, the, um, the notion of um, the point, this locus of supraphysical manifestation is replaced instead by um, axes uh, having really just neutral numerical value. Of course, this is one of the big shifts into modernity is that numbers are become quantities instead of having qualitative dimensions, which they did in the ancient world. So in the ancient world, the number system doesn't start with zero, it starts with one, which is the oneness of God, the oneness of being, and that this then breaks down into differentiation below that. Um, so, but whereas when you th then have the quantitative structure, it's just one as a singular thing, a one, a quanta. And, um, and we kind of see that sense of the ancient cosmological understanding of oneness in the point, the, the importance of the point in the medieval grid, because it's singular and, and expresses the sense of this oneness manifesting in the physical world. Whereas then when we have the Cartesian grid, especially when they're associated with numerical values, coordinate systems, um, it loses that, that sense of the superphysical breaking in through the, the world. It becomes a way of, of laying out and um, and uh, organizing um, the visible reality, the surface of reality, the appearances of reality. And Williamson points out that this is then um, important for transferring the sense perception of reality onto other um, elements. The example that he gives here is this woodcut by Dura showing a a Renaissance method of of drawing and painting, um, where a grid is set up uh, vertically, and that the, um, the 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 grid is then the, the shapes and the forms and the colors are transferred from the visual sense of the grid onto a grid on a piece of paper down below. This is actually a method that I I learned when I took a a painting class 
um, in university. We just we used this, and so he then makes the connection connection also with uh, with Mercator, the way of producing maps, and that the sense of the grid being a manifestation of the supra physical in the medieval mode, then switches in this early modern really Renaissance mode as a way of laying down, establishing, and quantifying. Uh, the appearances of reality. So we get down to this, this surface level of of reality, which if you remember from the um, the cosmology talk in one of the last videos, is the fallen aspect of the of the cosmological hierarchy. Um, so th then he discusses then Descartes' um, development. Of, of the Cartesian grid um, in, the, in, in the later Renaissance and how he points out how this stress on the physical appearance of reality, of quantifying it, um, causes this detachment from abstract notions of, of the underlying structure of reality and then the physical appearance of reality. Of course, this causes the famous paranoia of, of Descartes his paranoia about appearance, what he sees and, and if he really exists or not. And so this begins this this search for um, an understanding of the of the underlying laws of appearance of the physical world, of physical reality. And um, and of course the grid plays an incredibly important role in this. And this then then leads to the the hyper realistic art that's produced in the later part of the nineteenth century, and then in the next mode, uh, Williamson talks about the modern grid and talks about how this obsession with the surface of reality kind of reached a peak um, in the later part of of the say late Renaissance, early nineteenth century, the kind of very early modern. And that then this shifted towards a strong move towards the underlying structure of reality, what the what was underneath the surface. And um, this he then points to things like Piet Mondrian's paintings, of course Piet Mondrian's paintings with the with the um, the grids of black lines on a on a white plane. And with the prime colors filled in in different squares, has this sense of this elemental, fundamental rules of the universe sense of structure that underlies reality. And um, here, there's that cell-like sense of the grid that then starts to become more prevalent in this in this modern era. Um, here, Williamson points out that it's really the notion of field that then becomes of primary importance with the grid. And he gives examples, for example, of Garrett Reitville's Red and Blue Chair of 1917, how um, instead of the cell or the intersection, the actual the, the planes, um, the vertical and horizontal uh, axes don't touch, they just overlap and they continue on to infinity so there's then this notion of of field centeredness um and that kind of decenteredness where things can kind of continue on forever um this notion of cont continuity then spreads throughout this sense of the grid and um uh he also then points out that this um this led to a feeling of an importance and a sense of anti-individualism because there's this sense of the field, the continuity, um, and the infiniteness of, of being. And this led to senses of nationalism and other kind of impersonal senses. And he points out various graphic designers who who had this 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 sense of the grid, the continuity, and how the importance of the negative, the white space in in the graphic design became much more important. And he also noticed that 
there was also a, a dropping of the use of serif typography, um, which decreased the visual interaction between um, the letter forms and the white space. So there's then a sense that develops in graphic design of blocks of text and letters kind of floating on a continuous field. And so there's this notion then of this underlying field that develops from the grid being in the in the renaissance of, of honing in on the surface and then at a certain point going beneath the surface into the general laws of the universe and that that field then is what the surface then plays on and that's then he sees happening in modernity in the 20th century in graphic design art and architecture he talks then about planes shifting and sliding and we see this then in architecture in Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe where there's that sense of the field and then columns walls windows are just things that shift and slide on this universal field then he makes a very interesting uh, shift here looking at the postmodern grid and he points out that the, the the swiss grid enjoyed its heyday during the 60s but then in the 70s um another of graphic designers started to overthrow those conventions and he points out that the postmodern grid was no longer this field or this underlying logic behind the surface of reality um it then started to break and disrupt itself um, and that the grid became a decorative element and he has this sense then of the grid shifting and breaking and he gives a lot of uh, typographical examples here like Wolfgang Weingart state art aid poster so that the grid starts to shift and break and he then gives up several really interesting examples um, where and this is actually the longest part of the essay is where he gets into the the, the idea of the postmodern grid because um, he characterizes it as <clears throat> this shifting and this opening up to depths below the grid um, and he gives examples of types of advertising or tv shows like or movies like tron where one breaks in through the grid and goes into an underworld or other situations where something bursts out from the grid and comes in through past the screen. And so then there's this sense of these dark libidinal forces underneath the grid. And this is what he characterizes as, as the postmodern. And um, you know, one of the interesting ways that he kind of frames up the whole thing is how he frames really postmodernism as a late... Um, modernism as really just a kind of a shifting of what was already there and one of the i think the beautiful thing with this essay is the whole movement the whole perspective through it it gives us a sense of the medieval which is a world steeped in spirituality and religion of the grid being a symbol a sense our sense of the grid as being these points where the supraphysical where the logos shines through the world and then how this shifts and then the renaissance descartes the grid becomes a way of framing the physical appearance of reality and of course then once the appearance of reality becomes a, th a thin film a, a surface then there's there's paranoia there's doubt about reality and then when there's that doubt then the shift goes to look below the surface to find the underlying rules the underlying laws that we can rely on and then what happens in the postmodernity is then those that underlying hidden grid if you will uh is then torn apart and then reveals all these dark chaotic forces and so i think what jack williamson is been able to perceive and is looking at the history of the uses of the grid in, in the Western world in this pivotal time span of our history is he shows this movement down the cosmological hierarchy, this poking below the surface of 
laws, looking at this chaos, but which also, of course, comes with all this energy, right? All these graphic design elements have this sense of the grid ripping open as something bursting forth, forth this life force, but also this chaos, also this destructive thing. He mentions, of course, the futurists who were obsessed with uh, the ripping open speed, death, the machine, and and all that. And I think really what we can see here also is Williamson has a, uh, a sensitivity for that sense of the divine that existed in um, in the medieval. And um, it's another great example to show how these cultural products, I mean like a grid, the grid, just the different ways that we use and we experience the grid reveal these deep movements of the human spirit through time. And understanding that and being able to read cultural history, being able to read architecture and art in the light of these movements inside the cosmological territory, inside the movements of the of the spirit through this territory, we can better understand where we are and better read the symbolic landscape of our own cultural milieu. And so this essay is an, an, an absolutely incredible and, and um, piece of work and piece of history and cultural thought. Um, that's everything for today. Uh, thanks very much. Bye.